Good afternoon. My name is Megan Guth, and I'm really excited to introduce this talk, Beyond Burnout, Hacking Your Way to a Healthier Work-Life Balance, featuring Rated R co-founders Lily Sierra-Spira and Rachel Cornejo. I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this event possible. And don't forget to visit the Expo Hall, where the sponsors are. Um, there's contests and swag and community organizations you should check out. And if you'd all please remember to fill out the speaker survey, feedback is much appreciated. The link will be posted in the chat. Lily and Rachel formed Rated R during the pandemic alongside Pearl Weizdige to share strategies for coping and maximizing positive mental health during sensitive online work. After spending multiple years as Austin investigators combing the deep dark corners of the internet and viewing traumatic content for research labs at UC Berkeley's School of Law and Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, they realized the strategies they learned there are applicable to many different types of sensitive online work. Please welcome Lily and Rachel. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Megan. Um, I'm Rachel and Lily and I are excited to share this talk with you beyond burnout, hacking your way to a healthier work-life balance. Um, so without further ado, let's dive right into it. Um, just briefly, today's agenda, um, we're gonna intro the session, talk about some important key concepts such as holistic security, um, resilience and trauma, um, and then spend the bulk of our presentation delving into recommended strategies to deal with some of these things. Um, since we only have 20 minutes, we're just gonna run through it on a really basic level. Um, and then we're gonna direct you to our website where there's kind of more in-depth toolkits and resources and so on. Um, and then we'll just end with some closing thoughts. Um, so without further ado, once again, I'm Rachel. Um, Lily is presenting with me. Um, we started this project to support professionals and activists who deal with sensitive online content. Um, and we're really excited to share what we've learned with all of you guys. Um, and also, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to us on social media. Um, our info should be in our bios, um, but we might be putting it up at the end as well. Um, beautiful. So now, without further ado, Lily is going to lead us in a brief breathing exercise to ground us before we jump into the meat of our presentation. Yeah, so hi everyone. It's lovely to be here today, uh, especially presenting with Rachel, uh, one of my co-founders of Rated R. And so I'm just gonna guide us through a brief, uh, breathing exercise. So we're gonna start up, start off by uh, sitting up straight, shoulders back and relaxed. And you wanna sort of have your spine aligned if it helps pretend like there's a string going down your spine and just pull it up like your jaw. And then put your hands on your stomach because we're going to be breathing with our diaphragm, which sits at the bottom of our lungs. This is going to be deep breathing. And so we're going to do a four, four, eight. Uh, so we're going to breathe in through our nose for four. Because our nose uh, filters out all sorts of particles from the air. We're going to hold our breath for four. And then we're going to breathe out through our mouth for eight. So breathe in. One, two, three. Four, hold, one, two, three, four, breathe out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Try it again, maybe close your eyes um, and make sure your stomach is expanding and contracted. So breathe in, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, breathe out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is a breathing exercise um, that's really great to do just to center yourself whenever uh, you're about to do anything or just when you're when you're just about to be. So yeah, uh, with this in mind, I'm gonna pass it on to back to Rachel to talk about why we're here today. Perfect. Well, thank you, Lily, for centering us. And please, to everyone here, remember to do this um, throughout your workday as a recentering whenever you're delving into a particularly hard task. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about holistic security and why it's important. So if you take nothing else from this presentation today, I would want you to take this concept of holistic security. Um, and what I mean by that is, as you can see from this triangle here, physical, physical digital, and mental security all working together. Um, and the main takeaway here is that you need mental security and you need to think about your own mental security. We all do because when we are not mentally secure, we're risking how well we're doing our job of protecting other people, right? All of us entered the cyber world because we want to be protectors. We want to protect things digitally. We understand that digital and physical protect, digital and physical protection work together. Um, and so we need to keep in mind that we need to make, be responsible for our own mental security in order to have the other two types and to help others. Um, 
And so now just kind of a brief exercise to start thinking about how this applies to our work. Um, just take a moment and visualize what is one of your main job related tasks. Um, so in my case, I work as an analyst at the Global Cyber Alliance. So one of the main things I do is um, I analyze Internet of Things threat feeds every day and I look at the commands used by bad actors to attack IoT devices. So that's my task. Um, but think about a task that you kind of do. And now think about, take a moment and really consider the wider impact of your work, right? When you do this task, what is at stake? So for me, um, when I do this, my personal physical security is gonna be at stake. You know, if I slip up and I accidentally click on a link um, in one of these commands, right? I could download the malware that's being downloaded onto these IoT devices onto my own computer. Obviously that is very stressful, you know, but what else is at stake, right? If I don't analyze these commands and I don't find out where they're coming from and don't work towards taking out the bad actors, then all of the consumers who buy these IoT devices are gonna be at risk, right? You know, they're gonna get spied on, perhaps, you know, all of the US is gonna be at risk because our critical infrastructure is maybe gonna get disabled through an IoT attack. Um, so it's really easy to kind of get overwhelmed by thinking about what's at stake. And you know, that takes a toll on us, right? You know, it takes a toll on my mental health to understand, yes, I'm doing this task that maybe every day is like very routine, but you know, there is a lot at stake. It does take a toll on you. Um, and so what me and Lily want to encourage you to do is to really sit with the feeling and understand the toll that these things take on you and then work towards developing resilience um, to get through it. So going back to the idea of what toll does this take on you, right? This idea of trauma um, and trauma can result from experiencing a traumatic event at work or in your personal life, right? So experiencing things firsthand. Um, so at work that could look like, you know, if there is a cyber attack, that's gonna be really traumatic um, or in your personal life, like, you know, say, there's a death of a family member that's really traumatic and you have to keep working and keep being productive and keep protecting others in the cybersphere through all of that. Um, that's really challenging to do. And there's also secondhand trauma or vicarious trauma, right? Empathy with another person who's experienced a traumatic event, right? Like, so for example, what if you're working with the victims of a cyber attack, right? Like you might feel trauma even though the attack didn't happen to you um, because you're working with them and their experiences are falling upon your shoulders. Um, so really, you know, start acknowledging these things. But the good news is that you can develop resilience to these things. Um, and Lily and I defined resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, um, in the face of these traumas that we've now identified connected to our work. Um, and you guys may have heard of resilience in the cyber world as kind of, you know, the ability to adapt or anticipate to adverse cyber events and, you know, build up your enterprise um, so that you can protect against cyber events. But we want to encourage you to think about developing your own personal resilience at well in response to mental trauma and personal stress that we've talked about. Um, and the main thing about resilience too is that it's preventative ideally rather than reactive. Like some of the strategies that Lily is about to share with you, if you implement them now, the goal is to perhaps develop good habits so that you can already cope well by the time these traumas start hitting. Um, and just kind of, it's important to take time to be patient with yourself and develop resilience over time and understand that you know, each strategy that Lily talks about that you put into place builds towards this resilience. Um, awesome. So without further ado, Lily's going to take through you through some of the materials and strategies that we've developed um, to develop this resilience. Yes. Thank you so much for going over that, Rachel. Um, just so eloquently put, because you really can't pour from an empty cup. It's important to build up our capacity to help others through helping and supporting ourselves. But also helping people aside, you are a whole person and there's value just in that. So remember to respect and honor yourself. How do we do this though? I'm gonna present a few different strategies today. So the first thing I'm gonna present is the check-in. Checking in is especially important in order to make sure that you're providing yourself with self-care. Uh, next slide, Rachel. So we have uh, some slides here from the Rated R check-in deck uh, to guide you through the process of self-care. A lot of people think of self-care in the context of wine and face masks, I mean, both of which are great, but <laughs> self-care ultimately comes down to the basics. So these slides include things like, have you showered or had water or eaten? 
This is because our physical well-being is connected to our mental well-being. When we feel good physically, we can feel good mentally because, I mean, it is all connected. Our, our brains are a functioning part of our physical selves and they and it's important to treat your brain well so then your brain can treat the rest of your body well and vice versa a way another great way to check in with yourself and to make sure you're checking in with yourself is mindfulness mindfulness is the practice of being present and aware of the self this allows you to be aware enough of yourself and your needs in the moment so then you can act on supporting yourself you can practice mindfulness through meditation and a variety of cognitive behavioral exercises. Another, uh, another great resources is youfeellikeshit.com. It's an interactive guide uh, to self-care, which is really helpful for holding yourself accountable and also motivating yourself through the process, especially when you know, you're going through something really difficult or you're just really tired and you don't even feel like you have the energy to really check in with yourself individually. Next slide. So uh, it's also really important to set boundaries in life, both physically and mentally. As I said earlier, the physical and the psychological world are deeply connected. Psychologists, for instance, say your bed should only be for two things, sleep and sex. When you work in bed, for instance, your brain begins to associate that space with stress, making it harder to sleep. I, for instance, used to work as an open source investigator alongside Rachel, and they really cautioned us against watching any of the videos or really taking in any of the material we had to take in for our jobs uh, anywhere that we wanted to be associated with relaxation, uh, in part because because the materials that we were witnessing are really traumatizing and you don't want to have a physical space associated with trauma because then you're not going to be able to use that physical space really for fully what it's intended, like relaxation or sleep. It's also important to not watch things like movies and TV shows in bed because then you're associating your bed with entertainment. Uh, both ways take away from what your bed should be associated with. This is um, this entire sort of system is called sleep hygiene, which is extremely important to making sure that you have a regular sleep schedule, which just again helps your mental health so much. If you can, it's also great to get different devices for your work versus your personal life. So again, you're having that association, then you're able to set clear boundaries for yourself. Not everyone has access to getting one device, much less two. So. You could also create separate accounts on your device. This helps optimize both your work and your play. Uh, the same thing goes for social media accounts. Have a Twitter for professional work and then have a Twitter for just fun and memes. So then again, you're really drawing that line for yourself. Also try to keep a consistent schedule when you're working and when you're not. Both of these help to make sure that you're getting the most out of your time working and out of your time relaxing. Next slide. And of course, we all need somebody to lean on, even the most introverted of us. If you can't talk to people in your personal life about your work due to an MDA or because you feel like they just won't understand, try talking to coworkers or join a professional network. Also, if you have access, consider finding a mental health care provider. And remember that you're, when you're looking for a mental health care provider, that there's a lot of different kinds of mental health care. From therapists to psychiatrists, when it comes to therapy, you can do psychoanalytical, cognitive behavioral, dialectic behavioral. There's also medication and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a really great therapy for people who have experience with PTSD. A lot of the times though, unfortunately, these things simply aren't accessible. So we have a free intersectional mental health resource guide on our website at ratedresilient.com. Next slide. And at the end of the day, it's just really important to reflect and meditate on these questions. What do I wish to accomplish through my work? 
personally, impact wise, what do I value? Is my current time being spent fulfilling those? Um, you know, even if uh, my work is very fulfilling, is it leaving space for me to just exist and be fulfilled in a different way? And asking yourself these questions, you may realize that you're no longer finding work fulfilling and or it's distracting from a lot of fulfilling your life in other ways. So consider taking time to work, study, or volunteer in another field. Maybe reignite uh, a passion for history that you had when you were in college. And if that's not something you can really afford to do, ask your boss if you can try different things at your work. If you're someone who does a lot of documenting hate crimes, for instance, that would get very tired, uh, tiring after a point. So maybe ask if instead of doing that for eight hours a day, you can do that for four hours a day and work on something else. Next slide. And if you can, take a break. Sometimes you just need a break and there's no shame in that. And maybe you take a break and you don't come back and there's no shame in that either. Sometimes we lose a passion for what we're doing. Sometimes we're still passionate about what we do, but we're no longer able to function as human beings, as ourselves within that work. It's a sad reality, especially when you still haven't lost that love for your work. But at the end of the day, you're a whole person and you can find fulfilling work elsewhere that allows you to also take care of yourself. Of course, like I said, it can be a privilege to leave these things behind. But just try your best to find that little corner of your life in order to make sure you're taking care so that you can take care of other things. In conclusion, I just really want to thank everyone for coming here today uh, and listening to me and Rachel talk about something that we're extremely passionate about, especially as former open source investigators and for people who are currently doing work that can be traumatizing at times and stressful, if not traumatizing. So thank you so much. And you can find more of our resources at ratedresilient.com. Uh, since we have a little bit of time left, if you have questions, uh, we're more than uh, happy to answer them or to go over different strategies. Yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, feel free to reach out to us over Twitter, LinkedIn, our website. Um, perfect. Any questions? I can't see the chat because I'm uh, presenting my screen. So if there's anything you get, my You can exit out of that, Rachel. It's all good. Uh, don't know so, if I can. Uh, I see from Mia G, how, how do you uh, do uh, with those surges of burnout after you complete a major long-term objective? So that is a great question, Mia. It's really, I mean, it's really difficult. I've, I've suffered through it myself, but I think one of the things is prevention. Resilience and mental health is not just something that you do after you've experienced trauma, it's something to prevent it in the first place. So if you're taking care of yourself throughout that major long-term objective, then the burnout will be less than it would be otherwise. And so keeping that preventative frame in mind and not just burning yourself out and being like, you know what, I'll, I'll put some, I'll, I'll put a Band-Aid on it later on that burn. No, try to prevent it in the first place. And in terms of dealing with it, I mean, again, it depends on what resources you have, but if you can take a break for a short amount of time and because if you're burnt out, you're burnt out. The only way to deal with it is to give yourself time and space and to have empathy for yourself like you would have for one of your friends or family members. Treat yourself like you would like you're your own best friend. I think that's really important. Yeah, did you have any comments on that? Oh sorry. Oh no, go ahead. 
Oh no, Rachel, just if you wanted oh. to say anything. Yeah. Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> anything else? Do we have time for one more? No, I was just going to say, uh, it reminds me of, you know, being on the airplane when they say, put your oxygen mask on first before you help others, because you really can't help others until you've helped yourself. Exactly. Completely. And, you know, you, it's, there are a lot of stepping stones. Like I said, sometimes you're so burned out that you find it hard to even take care of yourself. I think, unfortunately, a lot of us have been there, especially in our modern work culture, even in school. I know as someone who graduated in 2020, I was completely burned out after going to UC Berkeley for four years. It was really difficult for me. But oh, it's, it's important to try to make the effort to do those basic things, those building blocks of just food, water, sleep, and try to really build up from there if possible. Yeah, I mean, I also think that when you end a project, even though you feel burnt out, there's like a really exciting moment of opportunity, right? It's like you finish the project. What do you have to be excited about? You know, what freedom do you have to launch yourself into what comes next? And so I know exactly what you mean. We're like, I'll finish a project and I'm just like, well, I feel exhausted. I feel like I'm no longer working towards a goal. But I think that's a really important moment to reflect and think, you know, how did I feel about what I was doing? You know, like, was that a worthwhile use of my time? How can I improve? Um, how can I do better going forward? And so I think like taking those moments and seeing them as moments of opportunity to get excited about the future rather than moments to kind of like sit with the exhaustion of the past. That's something that helps me get through it. Um, if that makes sense. Awesome. Definitely. No, totally, totally correct, Rachel. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so much of this is about framing, which again can be really hard to do in the moment but uh that's a that's a great example of something that you know a cognitive behavioral therapist would would maybe say to someone um you know when it comes to reframing and so uh you can practice a lot of cognitive behavioral exercises even even without a therapist although i i do recommend a therapist instead of instead of me uh personally uh <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, there are some amazing healthcare providers out there. Um, it may take you a while to get to one you really meld with, but I think definitely worth it, especially if you're finding yourself in cyclical burnout. Beautiful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, well, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for this. Um, you know, there's there's some interesting comments in the chat as well about, I think, uh, the kind of collective burnout that we're feeling, you know, across the globe because of the pandemic and everything else. So really appreciate your talk on this. It was really refreshing. Having those definitive tools and the toolkit that you have on your website will be really helpful to folks, I believe. So thank you. That's awesome. what we're hoping. Thank you so much for having us and everyone wishing you a lovely rest of your day and a, lo a lovely resilient day. Yes, yes. Alrighty. Bye.